Hare Krishna. Great to be here once again on the sad and auspicious month of Kamakmak. Today I will speak about the sacred occasion of Shalat Purnima and I focus on how the Bhakti tradition reveals a very enduring vision of God. <clears throat> I'll speak this based on two themes, a verse from the Bhagavad Gita, which talks about the position of God, and a verse from the Bhagavad which talks about the disposition of God. So, the Bhagavad Gita 10.8 states that, I am the source of everything. Everything emanates from me. Knowledge, especially in the spiritual realm, is not about information. It is about transformation. So if we get knowledge about Krishna, that knowledge leads to a certain amount of transformation. And what is the transformation? Those who understand Krishna does, Bhajan, Te, Mama, they start becoming devoted to me. Buddha, Bhavasa, Manjita, Mama, with their whole heart, with their entire being. We see hundreds of attractive things in the world. Now, if you understand everything attractive comes from Krishna, then we can contemplate how attractive Krishna must be. So, everything attractive in the world is like if we are in a desert, dying for water, and all the attractive objects in the world are like drops of water. They're immensely attractive, but then the water that is there for a thirsty person and drop is insignificant, even insignificant. If there's drops of water, we think that this drops must be coming from somewhere. Where are they coming from? From the ocean. Let me go there. So similarly, if you understand that God is the source of everything, that means whatever we are attracted to in the world, whether it is beauty or whether it is wealth or whether it is power or whether it is influence, all of those attractive things come from God. And then, instead of getting captivated by the drops, we pursue the ocean. That is the meaning of this verse. That if you understand that God is the source of everything, then we, become, we start using our everything to attain God. So this is the position of God. He is all attractive. And Buddha, Buddha is wise, enlightened. In the Buddhist tradition, Buddha is considered the enlightened one. The Bhagavad Gita describes who is a Buddha. One who understands that everything attractive comes from Krishna. And therefore, the best thing is to become attracted to Krishna. Not to anything else in this world. Now, what, what does it mean when we say Krishna is all attractive? Sarva Akarishati Iti Krishna. At one level, we can say, okay, as I said, everything attractive is present in its fullness. So there are many beautiful people in the world, but the beauty of Krishna doesn't just supersede the beauty of everyone else. Rather, there's, there's, a, there's one, one conception that is uh, like a competitive conception. That, okay, this person is this form, this beautiful, this person is beautiful, this person is beautiful. And the top of the hierarchy is God. Like somebody is this powerful, somebody, somebody is this powerful, somebody is this powerful. Like we have tennis. Uh, multiple players. And then one particular player is number one. So God is not just the best of all beings. God is the basis of all being. He doesn't just stay at the top of the hierarchy as the best of all beings, but rather all of being, that is all existence, is based on him. Anybody who has anything attractive, that comes from God. God is the basis of all being. And when we understand this, we strive to become attracted to Him. Now, how do we become attracted to Him? Many of us may think that 
now our devotion is just an emotion. I sometimes feel devotion, I sometimes don't feel devotion. However, the bhakti tradition describes that in bhakti, devotion is not just an emotion. It is conscious, continuous cultivation. It is an emotion that means can be and needs to be cultivated. So when we come in satsang like this, when we come and do and go down to the puja of the Lord, you know, worship the Lord, we chant his holy names. All this what are we doing? We are giving ourselves stimuli connected to Krishna. And this is the cultivation of devotion. And for such cultivation of devotion, certain situations, certain occasions, certain stimuli are especially for. So we can say we all are forgetful souls. Suppose somebody has amnesia. And when they have amnesia, at that time, they have forgotten. Maybe a millionaire's son, a child, they have forgotten who they are. Maybe they are living like a poverty student person. Then, the people who are trained in amnesia, they try to present stimuli from their previous life. But do you know, do you remember this phone? Do you remember this jacket? Do you remember this pen? And gradually, the memory starts getting faint. Similarly, we are all suffering from amnesia, from forgetfulness, and bhakti is a process of exposing ourselves to stimuli by which our amnesia can be stored, by which our spiritual memory can be restored. Now, some stimuli are more powerful than others. If some, if say somebody had a life which they have forgotten, you just uh, show some house over there. Maybe okay, I remember I seen this house. But show them their own house. Okay. And they will get The stimuli are more powerful. But different stimuli can have different power. And different stimuli can also have different power based on their time. Say, if somebody used to go to go out for walks in a garden in the early morning. And then you take them early morning in the same garden. What happened? Been here before. Been here before. So the potency of the stimuli vary according to time, place, circumstance. And Kartik is a time when, by the Lord's grace, every spiritual stimulus <coughs> is much, much more potent. And this time in this month, if we expose ourselves to devotional stimuli, whether it is by chanting the holy name, whether it is by hearing about Krishna. Whether it is about by coming to the temple and beholding the darshan of Krishna, singing the Dhamma of the Rashtakam, by all these stimuli, uh, the potency of those stimuli is multiplied manifold by the Lord's grace. And our spiritual memory becomes activated faster. So, this is the background of first, I talked about the conception of God, and I talked about this month of Dhamma. Now, the month of Damodar begins with a beautiful festival called the Sharad Purnima. And this is the time when Krishna performs one of his most celebrated pastimes. And that is the Rasa Lila. So, this, this is a pastime, a Lila, where God's disposition is revealed. So I'll read a verse from the Bhagavatam. This is the first verse, 10.29.1, which describes the Lord's thoughts when he's about to perform the Rasmila. So he says, Bhagavan Pita Ratri Charodot Pulla Mallika Viksharan Brahmanas Chakre Yoga Maya Bhavashitaha So Bhagavan Pita Ratri That he is God. He is complete. He is all, as I said, all powerful, all beautiful, all wise. He doesn't need anything. And yet, Bhagavan Pita Ratri, what happened for him? When he saw the beauty of the Sharada night, Sharada Gopal and Gopal, the beauty of the sky, 
find the autism gene over there. We saw the flowers, the medical flowers blossoming. At that time, what happened? But children don't see the desire around the heart. Manash Chakra. In his mind, the desire arose. The desire for performing beauty past today. And then, Yoga Maya, the power should be gone. Yoga Maya, he took shelter of the This is a very amazing concept. Because Bob took the shelter of the devil. Bob is to take shelter of the one. I will take shelter of the one. He doesn't need the shelter. But the whole conception of Lila is that God exhibits His love through exhibiting His vulnerability. What do we mean by vulnerability? Whenever we want to have a relationship with someone, there are various aspects of the relationship. One is that we, we want to see whether this person really cares for us, whether this person really values us, respects us. But one important aspect is also we want to feel good in a relationship. The need to be valued is also a need to be needed. A need to be needed means that, suppose we are in a relationship with someone, and that person doesn't even notice our presence or absence. So you are there to put it, you are not there to do that. So we say, then, this is really, this is really a real relationship. Now, at one level, God doesn't need anyone. But, in, just imagine if there is some person who is very tall person. The person solves the problems of everyone. I have this problem, there is problem, go there, they solve it. I have the problem, they solve it. And now we may be in awe of that person. How impressive. And in general, we live in the world, we often have to put on a facade to some extent, a front that we are efficient, that we are we are intelligent, that we are competent. One of my friends is in I studied in IIM. IIM is one of the top management institutes in India. So he said they had a whole course on how to write your CV. And they said that if you are walking by a road and you see a tap which is dripping some water, and if you turn on that tap, you can put your put that in your CV. I am a water conservation activist. <laughs> So, <laughs> so the idea is that in the world we often try to portray that we are better than what we are. And we put on the front. And actually we have to, to a large extent, hide our weakness. Because the world is competitive. And not just competitive, it is ruthlessly competitive. Imagine a boxing match is going on and the boxers are just testing each other out, throwing some initial punches. And suppose a punch hits a, a, a opposite boxer on the jaw. It's a light punch, but the boxer faces. As soon as the other boxer notices, oh, that's very small. That means he has some already some means of vulnerability over there. Then the other boxer will just use that point and beat and beat and beat and beat that boxer into the mid. So, generally in any competition, the basic rule is hit where it hurts. That might not be a ethical rule, but that's how the functional way people function. So now, we all actually, to some extent, put on a, put on a facade. And the, we all carry big burdens. You know, sometimes they are traveling and carry a big burden on, uh, on a rather back pack. But the heaviest burden that we carry is often not what we carry on our back, it is what we carry on our face. The heaviest burden is often a mask. When we put on a front, and 
that uh, functionally in the world we do have to put on a front. But we need some people close to us, with so close to us that we don't have to put on a front. We can take it on. So a person who solves everyone's problems. And, and then when we go to them and they start expressing their concern, they say that, oh, and actually this issue is going on and not sure what to do. What do you think we'll try? We'll try this out if you will try it. Actually, we need reformer. If we have that idea that, oh, this person is perfect, then you may think, oh, if you are perfect, you are not all that perfect. That might lead to a decrease in the image. But if we want a real relationship, actually, when somebody takes on their front, we will feel valued, we will feel trusted. So that means you trust me so much that you trust me, I'm giving you all this. You trust me so much that you are admitting your vulnerability over here. Like every relationship, it actually becomes thickens when we are ready to admit vulnerability. Because then the other person feels valued, trusted, needed. So now this same dynamic applies to God. That Although God doesn't need anyone, all the Om, Purnamada, Purnamidam, Purna, Purnamudachate, Purnasya, Purnamadaya, Purnameva, Vashishate. Although God is complete in all respects, He doesn't need anyone. But the concept of Leela is that God voluntarily conceals His God. And thus, He he acts as if he needs someone. So in a sense, a Vila is like a drama. But it's not drama in the sense of something unreal. It's a drama in the sense it is there is reality, there is unreality, and there is something which is supra reality. It is a reality above reality, the supreme reality. So in the drama that is Krishna Leela, Krishna often acts as if he is not God. When he is crying because he is hungry, another Hindu runs and gives him food. At that time, if he is God, why should he be hungry? Everything exists within him. One of the, the pastimes which we adore in the Damodar mantra, the past past Damodar. Where Krishna is tied by Mother Ishu. And he's tied because he is so mischievous. And he's so hungry that he's break from God. How can God be hungry? But the idea is that God here doesn't act as God. So I'm explaining the Yoga, yoga Maya Upashna. That God is the shelter of everyone, but he takes shelter of yoga. Now if we consider the example of a drama, in a drama, there are the actors, maybe there's a hero, there's the heroine, the chief actors. Now the actors, they act according to the guidance of a director. So in Krishna Leela, Krishna is the hero. And Yoga Maya is the director. So Yoga Maya Upashita that Krishna takes shelter of Yoga Maya. Now we may say, okay, if Yoga Maya is a director, then and Krishna is being directed by Yoga Maya, what is Yoga Maya? Yoga Maya is a divine energy of the Lord. The word Yoga Maya is actually an oxymoron. Does anyone know what is the meaning of the word oxymoron? Oxymoron. Any other kids? Is any vocabulary? Yeah, it is a, it's a so oxymoron is where two where two words which have opposite sense are brought together. So if you tell somebody that was a brilliantly stupid thing to do, <laughs> now what do you mean? Was it brilliant or was it stupid? <laughs> so it's like if you have two opposite ideas brought together. It is, uh, so for example, suicide is an act of courageous cowardice. 
it's it's courage. to end your life requires courage but to end your life because you are unable to face the problems of life that is cowardice so courage is cowardice so yoga maya is two opposite words brought together why yoga is connection yoga is the process by which we establish connection with the divine the finite consciousness connects with the infinite consciousness whereas maya is all about illusion and disconnection maya is the agency which makes us forget about god and it gets us deluded in this world so then yoga is connection maya is disconnection so what is yoga maya maya is illusion that causes disconnection yoga is the process that brings about connection so what is yoga maya yoga maya is the illusion that increases connection it is the illusion what is the illusion that increases that intensifies our connection with the lord so mother ishula she actually loves the lord loves loves krishna but under the influence of yoga maya mother ishula thinks that if i don't feed krishna then krishna will stay hungry krishna will become sick he may even die i must feed him but that that's an illusion but an illusion that increases our absorption in krishna so that's yoga maya it is a divine it is an illusion that increases devotion so yoga maya is not just the illusion that increases devotion yoga maya is the agency is the divine personality who brings about this divine illusion so you i said krishna is the like the hero and yoga maya is who director now she is the director at that time we may say that if krishna is working according to the director's direction direction then how is krishna in charge how is krishna the controller well that's the twist now the director also directs according to a script which is written by the script writer so in krishna leela krishna is the actor yoga maya is the director and krishna is the script writer <laughs> so yoga maya directs krishna according to krishna's script and that's why krishna is in control and krishna is not in control also krishna when krishna enters into the leela he forgets that he is god but his forgetfulness is not like our forgetfulness whenever he wants he can remember the damodar leela krishna is tied up and he can't untie himself and then suddenly he remembers oh my devotee narada had promised these trees that i will deliver them so whenever he wants he can manifest his divinity his omniscience his omnipotence that's the meaning of it it's a leela it's a drama now in the leela now why does krishna have to perform all this elaborate drama kind of thing that is to reciprocate love i said that love is increased when there is when one exhibits vulnerability in a loving relationship so the whole arrangement of yoga maya the setting is done so that even god can exhibit vulnerability so krishna exhibits vulnerability when he shows to mother ishula i need you i need food if you have to give me food and give it now i'm hungry so similarly that idea that vulnerability fosters intimacy that we can very easily understand with respect to krishna in the vatsalyas his mother my mother he needs his mother but the ras leela takes this one level higher and what is that one level higher the shar purana is the time when krishna begins his pastimes with the gopis with his conjugal associates so krishna sees the beautiful setting of vrindavan the full moon the flowers and he longs for the association of the gopis and then he starts playing on his flute now the the idea over here is that krishna although he is god and god means that everything that he does is pure it is transcendental that is the fundamental thing we need to understand janma karma chame devyam एवं यो वैति तत्वदहो त्यक्त्वा देहं पुनर्जन्म वैति 
बाणे किसोर जुनाऊ ठेठ जन्म कर्म चुने विज्ञान माय अपीरेंस एंड एक्शन आर फ्री फ्रॉम एनी सेल्फिश मोटिवेशन दिव्य स्ट्रांजरी सिक्स माय एक्शन एंड अपीरेंस आर फ्री फ्रॉम ऑल सेल्फिश मोटिवेशन those who know this truth with full conviction what happens to them those who know this truth with full conviction don't return after death in the cycle of reincarnation but attain eternal life with me in devotional liberation so krishna says that if you understand you become like that to me so the idea here is that often this attraction between the male and the female there is a basic principle of material existence but that attraction can also cause a lot of delusion a lot of entanglement a lot of distress people do so many things in the name of love which are at all often not very loving so they get captivated and deluded but the loving attraction that we have in the world is a reflection of the pure love that is present between the soul and krishna and that love is depicted in its purity and fullness in the love between krishna and the gopis so if you consider as x axis and y axis so now in the y axis there is negative and there is positive so often the attraction the infatuation in the world which is there that is in the negative axis because it makes us forget our identity as souls it makes us obsessed with body and consciousness it deludes us but different from this negative axis is the positive axis in the positive axis where the greater the emotion the greater the attraction the greater is the purification the greater is the liberation so there is what krishna is exhibiting when krishna is attracted to krishna calls the gopis he calls them by playing his flute and he plays the flute he's inviting them all to come and perform leela for him and they just drop everything and come to him sarva dharma paritajya mamhe picharanya jan the gopis drop everything that they are doing to come to krishna and this what it indicates it indicates how the soul what the devoted soul of krishna is the highest priority there is nothing more important than krishna and then the gopis come like this at that time the krishna is waiting for them and then they have this celebrated dance of divine love is called the rasa lila so like the bhagavatam describes rasa lila this is the first verse of the bhagavatam all the four to five chapters 10th chapter to 11th chapter 33rd chapter This is the first verse, and the last verse in the thirty-third chapter. And to understand the significance of this, let's go to the last verse now. And in the last verse, he says, "Tikrimitam rajavadhiritam chavishnu shadhanitanishwaryan tavaranayya bhakti param bhagwati patilab dhakamu rajogamashu anmotya chire dhiraha." It says that. At any point, you hear these verses of Krishna. Be greed, dumb. This is a real example. Be greed, dumb. Where is your mother? Dumb. Chavishnu. With the gopis, this pastime is performed by Krishna, but the Bhagavatam uses the word Vishnu because Vishnu is God in His majesty. So don't think this is just an ordinary God. This is God. One who understands these pastimes. Be greed, dumb. Where is your mother? Dumb. Chavishnu. One with faith hears these pastimes and shunaya, and then describes what. What will happen? Bhakti param bhagwati pratilabhya. One will get, one will become enriched with devotion. One will become empowered with devotion, and then rudro gamash apahino. Achire, dhira, that the, the worldly attachments, the worldly desires, the delusions 
तो गोल्डी डिजायर पे लोगों को होते हैं जो इनकम स्ट्रीम फ्रॉम द सो व्हिच इज अ वेरी स्ट्राइकिंग डिस्क्रिप्शन नॉर्मली इफ समबडी गोस एंड वाचेस अ मूवी एंड द मूवी इज फिल्ड विद से रोमांटिक और इरोटिक सीन्स देन इन द हार्ट्स ऑफ पीपल सिमिलर रोमांटिक एंड इरोटिक डिजायर विल कम बट हियर द भाव पता इज डिस्क्राइबिंग दिस पास्ट टाइम ऑफ कृष्णा विद द गोपीज and that might feel romantic but it says that all erotic desires within the heart or sensual desires will be cleansed it so how is it possible if we have some all the desire for that coming to us so there is a big difference over here and understanding that difference is key to appreciating krishna lila and especially appreciating krishna That is the Bhagavad Gita says that this world is like the reflection. Purnam Bhulam Adhashakam Ashwatham Yamahur Abhiyam Chandam Siyasya Parnani Yastam Vedha Sevedam The 15th one it says that this world is like upside down and entry. Upside down means that's what we see in a reflection. So now imagine somebody seeing a man in a reflection. And you say, oh, this mango, or oh, this, I love this. That mango is so delicious. I want to eat it. And they jump into the reflection to get the mango. They rush toward it, and they reach the mango, and they find the mango is not there. And they look again, and the mango is there. They reach out for it, and again, it's not there. What's going on? Again, they see it. Again, they reach for it. It's not there when they reach it. So, you know, that is often the way worldly pleasures are involved. They are always in view. They are never in experience. We keep seeing them, but when we try to experience them, what happened? Most of, if we look back at our long lives, many of the pleasures that we dreamt about, that we strive for, when we achieve them, they turn out to be at best an anticlimax. All that we thought was so wonderful, we just over the living. So the idea in the Bhagavad Gita is that this world is like a reflection. Everything attractive that we see is like a reflection of the real man. So somebody chasing the reflection is saying, "Man, boy, I reach it, but I don't get it." Then they distance themselves. Why do you think I want it? They say, "Okay, here there is a river, and there is a tree, and there is a there is a mango over there. So although the mango looks or appears over here, and the mango appears over here." Both the mangoes may appear exactly same, but to get to the real mango, one has to go in a direction opposite to the one which one was going when they were chasing the reflected mango. So what the Bhagavad Gita is saying is when it says that if we hear the pastimes of Krishna, that's the real mango, and once somebody gets their hand on the real mango, once they taste the real mango, then The attraction to the illusory mango will automatically go. It's illusory. I don't need it. I want the real substance. So, what happens in Bhagavad Gita is saying, if we hear properly the pastimes of Krishna and understand what is going on over here, then we start getting a taste of the real mango. Yet there are some mrittu dasya namnyatrasya nati kuchhe. Once we get, once we get this taste. Taste of remembering Krishna, of loving Krishna. That taste is so captivating, so uplifting, so enriching that we feel that all the other tastes are irrelevant. Now, when we taste the other taste, what change? Once we taste the real mango, all the reflections are only the reflections. So this is the potency of Krishna Lila. But if we hear the Krishna's pastimes, then we can attract, get attracted to the real mango. We experience the real mango, and all the illusory mangoes that we be attracted to, that they go to their home with us. Now, unfortunately, in today's world, the number of illusory mangoes have multiplied so much. Maybe in the past, if people wanted to entertain themselves, there might be one TV, twenty channels. 
now not only there are hundreds of channels now with internet there are thousands and thousands of sites and our mind starts believing something somewhere must be enjoyed and then we keep searching one two three four five keep exploring 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 yes some things may be may seem to be more enjoyable some things may seem to be less enjoyable and i think that nothing will be fulfilled nothing will be really meaningfully satisfying to our heart there's nothing wrong it's not against entertainment but we have to see that entertainment doesn't become an alternative to god it doesn't become something which we think this is what i need and i don't need to gain spiritual understanding i don't need god so the bhagavatam is this particular past time which is performed by krishna in shall poorly made praise a pointer is a direct is a attractor for us towards the beauty of the ultimate reality so the great devotees of the lord they are so attracted to remembering krishna to loving krishna to absorbing themselves in krishna that they feel nothing else matters sarati chennai ni sasham krichakre urvidhi mahaviram swachit tarantum sukhataram aparam na jatu jaami parichadan smaranam hrite matiyam sukhataram aparam na jatu jaami i do not know any happiness that can compare with the happiness of remembering krishna observing my consciousness in krishna <coughs> krishna is like an ocean of nectar we are struggling in the world to get some drops of pleasure but krishna is like the ocean of nectar if we can absorb ourselves in krishna and then all other pleasures all other troubles will fade into insignificance and we will experience the supreme enrichment of him life will often have its troubles but if we are absorbed in krishna then life's troubles won't trouble us because we will be experiencing something much higher much deeper much richer the world can hurt us in many ways but when we absorb ourselves in krishna that that absorption is so healing that we will realize the greater in the world's power to hurt is krishna's power to heal and that accessing that healing enriching potency of krishna is the opportunity that we all have in this incremental kartik beginning with this extremely sacred occasion the shall for him and we can all pray the lord that we can increase our connection increase our devotion increase our absorption in him during this sacred month so i'll summarize i spoke today on this topic of how <coughs> krishna is all attractive and how we can understand the position and the disposition of god so god is not just a remote controller existing somewhere god is the source of everything that we find attractive and he is not just the best of all means he is the least of all means so everything attractive is like a drop of water and god krishna is like a ocean so whatever pleasure anything else gives us krishna can give us that and much much more so the knowledge of krishna should lead to a transformation that i want to become devoted to him and for becoming devoted to him bhakti yoga is a process that cures our spiritual amnesia and bhakti gives us many krishna related stimuli which we expose ourselves to and then we start to bring our life with krishna our love for krishna and during this sacred month of kartik every bhakti stimuli its potency becomes multiplied manifold by krishna's mercy and it can activate and accelerate our devotional journey to krishna and then with that in this particular uh, on the, this particular yashar purnima what exactly happens it is the lord who performs his pastime where he exhibits one of the deities 
the world is a tough place and often we put on a front. The heaviest burden that we carry is often not on our back but on our face. So the world is tough and hit where it hurts is often a rule amid the ruthless competition. But this front can become exhausting and with those whom we love and trust, we take off our front. And at that time, if somebody very powerful exhibits vulnerability, it actually increases the connection, increases intimacy. So similarly, although God is all complete, all powerful, for an intimate connection with his devotees, he exhibits vulnerability. And how does he exhibit that? For that, there is the arrangement of yoga maya. The Bhagavatam says that Krishna took shelter of yoga maya. He is the supreme shelter. How can we take shelter of yoga maya? It's like a drama in which Krishna is the actor. Yogamaya is the director and Krishna is also the script writer. So Krishna is simultaneously in control and not in control. And in this way, when Krishna is under the influence of Yogamaya, Yogamaya is the oxymoron. That is the illusion that increases connection. And Yogamaya comes over Krishna and comes over Yashoda also. So Yashoda feels Krishna is life. I don't, if I don't feel you. And Krishna thinks, I will die if I don't get food. I need it. And in that way, their bonding becomes deep. And similarly, as with Krishna and the gopis. So, Vichara Purnimana, it Krishna sees the beautiful setting of the Vrindavan forest from the beautiful moon, the beautiful flowers, and he wants to perform Rasa And he plays his flute. And he exhibits his vulnerability and need for his purest devotees. And the Bhagavatam says that if we hear the Asmila properly in, with a proper, with proper association and guidance, then it will free us from sensual desire. How does that happen? Because this is not about sensuality, it is about the supreme spirituality. Sensuality is the negative axis. Pure spirituality is the positive axis. Sensuality is like the reflected mango. Pure spirituality is the real mango. So the Rasmila gives us a vivid picture of the real mango, a vivid experience of what pure spiritual relationships look like. And then once we get that, get a glimpse of that, then the infatuation with worldly desires and worldly cravings cuts. The more we get connected with Krishna by exposing ourselves to Krishna related stimuli, the more all of us can become enriched. And this enrichment is so powerful that although the world promises us pleasure in many ways, it doesn't deliver. The world's pleasures are just anti climax. And the world gives a lot of trouble for us. But if we are enriched with our connection with Krishna, then the world's troubles will no longer trouble us. The world's illusions will no longer put us in illusion because we will have found the supreme satisfaction. And Karthik is an opportunity to accelerate, to activate and accelerate our journey toward that ocean of divine satisfaction. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Are there any questions? Yes. It depends. Every relationship is different. And you have particular roles and responsibilities. And you have to act in a way that is appropriate for that role and responsibility. Suppose somebody is a doctor who is treating a very sick patient. Now, sometimes the symptoms of the disease will be so confusing or complicated 
the doctor may not exactly know how to treat her. But the doctor just throws up and I don't know how to treat you. Then the patient may become more demoralized. Now, of course, the doctor just gives some treatment without telling, without actually knowing whether it's going to work or not. Then that may be even deception. But in front of the doctor, the doctor, in front of the patient, the doctor may just encourage and calm the patient and then consult some experts, maybe who's a bit more experienced than them. So when we say a fright, it's not necessarily always a bad thing. To some extent, all culture, all civilization means we put on a fright. Right? We all have certain desires, cravings, emotions, which are very unwholesome. Imagine, now all of us, we can't see each other's thoughts. And we can't see each other's thoughts, desires, cravings. And that's a great blessing. <laughs> If we started seeing each other's thoughts, desires, cravings, if you think like this, we have this kind of desires. Not a single relationship could be sustained. Is it? <laughs> so, at the level of the mind, our mind is wild. But culture or civilized behavior means that even if the mind comes up with some uncultured or uncivilized desires, we restrain it, we discipline it. Now, if so there is a there is an inner inner emotion, there's outer action. And there is some regulation in between. There's some regulation in between the two. And that regulation itself is a sign of culture. But now sometimes that regulation may lead to hypocrisy. Culture means, yeah, you know, I don't want to act in an uncivilized way. I don't want to explode at someone. That's that's culture. But if we keep the internal the way it is and then act differently externally so that we can exploit the other person, then that is hypocrisy, that is deception. But if we are restraining the internal to gradually remove the internal, then that is, that is just civilized behavior. So sometimes some desire, so the front is not always a bad thing. It depends on the intent between the front is. The intent is to restrain whatever the bad negative is in us, then that's culture. The restraint is to hide it so that we can ex we can exhibit later and exploit others. That is deception. So when the now in certain places the front needs to be, uh, as you said, put down. For that purpose, we need to know whom we can trust, who will not misunderstand us, who will not exploit us, and that has to be done carefully. If we don't, uh, say for example, know how to do something, then we may have to ask someone else. But that it can be done in a way that doesn't uh, decrease other people's confidence in us. It, it depends on what the kind of our relationship with that person is. And based on that, in general, in every relationship, it's we first feel the pulse. It's like if we want to swim, we don't know how cold the water is. So we might just put our toes in the water and see how cold it is. Then we might put our foot in the water. Then we might put our leg in the water. And gradually then we might enter it. So like that, we feel our way inside. We explore, we, we exhibit a little bit of vulnerability and what does the other person do? If they laugh at us, if they, if they mock us, then we better don't do that. Now we are not meant to laugh at others. We are meant to laugh with others. Now we are all in the same boat. I will be vulnerable today, you will be vulnerable tomorrow. So if we have that understanding, then we won't, uh, we will we won't be, in, we'll be careful in uh, exhibiting our vulnerability and we'll be careful also when others exhibit their vulnerability to not exploit them. Any other question? Yes, ma'am. Okay. 
So how can we similarly define Mahamaya? Mahamaya is the illusory energy which, which serves two purposes. It is experimentation and rectification. Say, I was in Australia, somebody asked me this question that if God wants us to do good things, then why are the bad options so many in the world and the good options so few? So I explained that's how it is in every multiple choice exam. <laughs> <laughs> In a multiple choice exam, if five options, four are wrong. If the answers were chosen simply on probability, then the students could sue the teacher. Because I have a chance of getting the right answer only 20%, and you expect me to get 40% to pass. It's unfair. But the answers are not meant to be chosen on probability, they are meant to be chosen on education, on study, on assimilation of the subject. Similarly, Yoga Maya is that energy of the Lord which tests us. And she tests us by giving us multiple options. And most of the options are options which can, which can drag us down in consciousness. Then if we understand that she is like a teacher, she is like a, a teacher who is conducting a test. And the purpose of the teacher is not to fail the student. The purpose of the teacher is to promote the student, but promote the student who has studied. So Prabhupada says in lecture that you know, yoga, that Mahamaya allows those souls to go to Krishna who want to serve Krishna, not those who want to bother Krishna. Bother Krishna means if somebody is very self-centered, not God-centered. And that will be a, a sabhas in the spiritual world. That will not be, uh, it will not be according to the mood of the spiritual world. That everybody is trying to lovingly serve. So our desire is a purified. So if we have an impure desire, then we get we get tempted and we get diverted. If our desire is pure, we pass on. So it's uh, the tests of tests that are given by Yoga Maya, Mahamaya. They, those tests give those who are serious about spiritual life options to show their seriousness and to become more serious. So the test of Maya makes the serious more serious and the test of Mahamaya make the unserious more unserious. More casual, more, more casual. Yeah, okay, there's so many options, let's do this later. And like that. So, the, so that is also meant to ultimately take us toward Krishna. But the way to taking us toward Krishna is by by giving us alternatives to Krishna and seeing whether we choose those alternatives or we choose Krishna. And if we choose Krishna, then we go toward him. That's why Krishna says that Daivyesha Gurmani Mamaya Duratya Mamayi Prapadyante Maya Me Tantaradite That if we take shelter of Krishna, then Maya can be overcome. If we don't, then it's difficult to overcome. Almost impossible to overcome. So Prabhupada was once asked that if our purpose is to serve Krishna, then why is Maya still so strong? So Prabhupada immediately said, because this purpose is not strong. If we strengthen our purpose, Krishna, I want to serve you, I want to come close to you. Then all the alternatives that the world is offering, we will get that intelligence by which you can say no to them. Buddhi yoga, I'll be the intelligence by which you can come to me. Does that answer your question? Thank you. So thank you very much for your attention and participation. Shri Prabhupada Ki Gaur Prabhupada Ki Gaur Prabhupada Ki Gaur Prabhupada Ki